2003 was in a bit of a transitional period in terms of dinosaur knowledge. For reference, the show that started this whole dinosaur documentary phase, Walking with Dinosaurs, was at this point already four years old and it really wasn't aging the best. Although it came out when interest of dinosaurs peaked in the late 90s, paleontology already had a massive feathered revolution that was underway. Although a few imprints and other dinosaurs like Archaeopteryx were known to have feathers, in general it was assumed most dinosaurs around this time period were thought to be scaly. However, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, new discoveries came from the Nichian Formation, which showed how much dinosaurs were feathered. Dinosaur books during this time did try to share the information among young readers, and we did mention how when dinosaurs ruined America it did have feathering to an extent, but Dinosaur Planet stands out with their feather design. Although not as good as modern feather designs, it was a step up over the Walking with Dinosaurs designs, which either didn't have them, or they didn't look really good. For whatever reason, BBC documentaries during this time were very concerned with their featherings. You could excuse Walking with Dinosaurs for being made around the same time while these major discoveries were happening, but Chased by Dinosaurs had little excuse and most BBC documentaries follow this trend. American documentaries, however, usually have feathered dinosaurs or at the very least, feathered a small theropods fairly reasonably. In general, the feathering is just one part of Dinosaur Planet's quality. This documentary takes the style of when dinosaurs own and refines it to be even better. It sticks to a few dinosaurs that we've named to get attached to them. However, at a few points, paleontologist Scott Sampson presents the ideas to the watcher and explains the concept in a way anyone could really understand. He also explains paleontology as an ever-changing concept, not every idea we have around these animals being entirely set in stone. Each episode's anchor also introduces a different concept, which subtly works around the ecology of the episodes. For example, Pod's Travels is an episode about how animals colonize island and adapt to the pressure of a small space to live on. It does so through the lens of a mainland dinosaur trapped on a strange island where everything is small. The designs are pretty good for 2003 actually, and the narration is an excellent job, and it's in my head what I think of when I think of dinosaur documentaries. These titans, called saltosaurs, have been on the move for weeks. All of them are females. Generations of mothers and daughters, sisters and aunts. They're heading for their nesting ground in a ritual as old as time. However, it isn't without its flaws. A fair amount of dinosaurs are fragmentary, and it does the standard mistakes documentary of its time did, like sized up and misplaced dinosaurs. The most infamous one here is the car Caradontosaurus, which made its way all the way from Egypt to South America. It's uh, about the same as the fictional raptor from its predecessor. In the defense of the show, however, there are potential, and I do say potential, car Caradontosaurus teeth in South America, so that is why they did use car Caradontosaurus in the documentary. So, although it's probably not exactly car Caradontosaurus actually, it could maybe be the potential Carcharodontid. The Carcharodontosaurus in the documentary has a head shape similar to a Giganotosaurus, so it also could be a stand-in for that as well. All in all, this documentary is one step forward from Rome, and I can safely say this is one of the great ones of its era. During this time, the BBC was working on yet another spin-off, one featuring Nigel Marvin yet again. Sea Monsters, or Chased by Sea Monsters in the USA, featured time-traveling zoologists we all came to know and love, this time on the high seas. In the 90s, he dove with the great white shark without a cage for a show Giants, which sadly now is lost media. From 2000 to 2003, he also hosted Shark Week. So, to put it lightly, Nigel and sharks go together almost as much as him and dinosaurs do. The series was produced by the same people that they're walking with, and it really shows. Sea Monsters reuses a few models from the previous shows like Beasts and Dinosaurs, but they really seem to fit their stride. The animals, movements, and models seem like a step up from the original series. The premise of the show is pretty interesting. Nigel time travels to seven different periods of time, each to see different apex predators of each time period. From the beast, this is the first time a lot of these Paleozoic animals would get models. They look pretty good. Both the sea scorpions and the placoderms especially look pretty good for the time, and it's nice to see areas outside the Mesozoic get some spotlight. Each one of the three episodes is cut into three segments each, one for each era they get into. It's framed in a way where the crew tries to find Apex Predator, spends most of the segment trying to lure it out, and then they interact with it when it does show up. One of my favorite examples was luring the Basilosaurus with whale calls in order to see it up close, 
or finger dunk Leostes when it comes close to see if you can bite through Chingmail. This is one of my favorite things to come from walking with, which is a pretty high bar considering I love almost everything that came from the series. I'm not sure if it's the more hands-on way this is compared to the other Nigel special, or if it's the ocean itself, but I really adore the series. Although, part of it I think has to do with the settings. As I've mentioned multiple times, ocean episodes and documentaries are part of my favorites, and to see all these seas and different points of time is just really cool. Also, it's just nice to see Nigel walk around and make his cherry energetic self. Some of them seem a bit over the top, like when he forced the tiny strophus to cut his tail off. It's really cool to see him interact with all these prehistoric animals. In the end, I'm not alone with a good amount of people praising the special once again. There are a few critics, most notably Richard Dawkins, who did not like Nigel Marvin in the episodes at all. He called them awful and thought that a wildlife presenter was condescending to the public at large. In my opinion, however, there is a level of charm that I think a wildlife presenter can bring to documentary series. Not every series needs a presenter, but I think having a presenter, whether it's in the past or the present, can just help something feel more real. There's a sense of scale right there. It helps show that nature isn't something that you could just look at, but something that you could hold on to, something that you could interact with. I think dismissing it as science communication ignores the fact that a lot of people, myself included, were interested in natural sciences by wildlife presenters like Steve Irwin and, and Nigel Marvin. I'm not alone either, many other exciting wildlife shows like this to be what inspired them to get into natural history. Overall, I highly recommend it. Please watch this if you love documentaries like this and you mesh slip by. 2004 was the first time in five years where there is no documentary content release of this kind, but 2005 would more than make up for it with four in a single year. This, in my opinion, is probably the peak of the dinosaur documentary era. One of the more famous wildlife presenters in the USA, during his heyday, Jeff Corden was oftentimes considered to be the American counterpart to Steve Irwin and Nigel Marvin. Similar to the two of them, you can just feel his love for nature whenever he's on screen, and he oftentimes seems so excited when he shows off the different animals around him to the camera. Host of the Jeff Corden experience at the time, he wasn't an unfamiliar face on TV. Although normally he has a chill energy compared to his contemporaries, that is thrown out of the window in Giant Monsters. In Giant Monsters though, he is an absolute maniac, he has his unhinged energy as he interacts with CG co-hosts. It's really fun to watch as he's hunted, chased, and just in general abused by each prehistoric animal. Come on, you stupid cart! Something weighing us down. You know, Tony, you've been such a good friend. That's why this really kills me. Oh, oh my god! Oh, I cannot replace this! Paying golf clubs! Oh, hundreds of dollars! Speaking of prehistoric animals on list, most of these are models that are used in other documentary series that Animal Planet hosted. Like, for example, the T Rex is reused for the Valley of T Rex, which is still a scavenger here. But what sets apart the animals from giant monsters are the different comparisons that Jeff does to their modern-day counterparts. Modern running theme is to share different adaptations that each animal from the past pairs with modern animals, and that one, tied with the conservation angle that we need to protect these big animals we have nowadays, is really nice because especially it isn't very common in prehistoric documentaries like these. Very cool, it's very nice to watch. It isn't perfect, especially the science content in the documentary hasn't aged particularly well. Fishing in Quetzalcoatlus, Scavenger Rex, and Megarachne being a spider, which we now know as a sea scorpion, are unfortunately things that date this documentary. But it's still very entertaining, and the conservation angle keeps it relevant in my opinion. This one is highly recommended. The truth about killer dinos is an interesting concept. It's essentially what you get when you mix Mythbusters with a dinosaur documentary. This two episode documentary tries to show how animals behaved with mechanical reconstructions fighting each other. The documentary is very good in terms of quality, and although not my favorite of the four, 2005, it's set apart by the mechanical reconstructions and a few standout moments. Most notably the fact that for the first time in BBC history, according to them, feathered velociraptors are on full display. Also, it shows a predatory T-Rex, something that, due to how prevalent Jack Horner was, I mentioned, was pretty rare. Although I've mentioned it a few times in this video series, there are two different viewpoints that tend to be shared around this point in history. Feather dinosaurs, non feather dinosaurs. Scavenger Rex, Predator Rex. It is nice to see different competing theories in different documentaries around this time. 
show people that paleontology isn't set in stone, and that different scientists come to different conclusions when it comes to paleontology. Everything in this documentary is very quality. Of course, the truth about killer dinosaurs is not completely faultless. For example, Ankylosaurus being put in the wrong habitat, that being Asia, and the model being used as Pinecosaurus, which is a different animal entirely. Despite that, I don't know why, but personally, I had a hard time getting into this one. It might be because, outside the mechanical bits, this is all just standard dinosaur documentary. That's not a bad thing. This is a very good standard dinosaur documentary. Everything from the presentation to the CG is pretty good for the time. Very shows quality, fun show. I feel, however, the other four just stand out, especially, in my opinion, the next one on our list. Most documentary series of this type focus on the biology of the animals discussed. Of course, that's the most obvious thing you can focus on. But oftentimes, we forget the cultural impact that dinosaurs have. Dinosaurs oftentimes are more than an animal. They're cultural icons, symbols of the times. We forget that similar to monsters and other creatures of myth, depictions of dinosaurs will evolve over the time, and culture around these animals shifts. It's the cultural impact of dinosaurs that T-Rex, a dinosaur in Hollywood, and other animal planet production focuses on. This documentary looks a bit cheaper than others in the series. It's a bit cheesy, and I love it. The documentary was made 100 years after the formal discovery of T-Rex, framing itself as a biopic. It features Hollywood star T-Rex discussing its origins from Hell Creek Discovery to its career as a movie star. It also pulls double duty, subtly telling the story about how paleontology and cultural perceptions of dinosaurs evolve, with T-Rex itself physically changing as perceptions change around T-Rex over time. It also pokes fun at the scavenger T-Rex theory as slander, and Feathered Rex as something that was both controversial and career-ending when it first had its career in the 40s. But now it's something that's celebrated, with T-Rex coming out in the end. Hmm. All jokes aside, I really love this documentary and I adore it for doing something different. Not every day a documentary talks about the cultural impact that dancers have on modern society. As far as I know, this is really the only one that does this, and I wish there was more documentaries that actually had a similar vein to this. When I was a kid, I actually really hoped for a sequel to the series. Now I'm getting older, I really want another documentary to talk about cultural evolution of different dinosaurs. Spinosaurus, for example, would be very interesting, or dinosaurs that shape trans and paleo art, like Deinonychus. This documentary is one of my favorites, despite the obvious lack of budget. CG in some areas, especially the King Kong and the alien CGs, are kind of bad, but the hammy acting and the writing, especially, it has a lot of heart and it wins me over. It's a dinosaur documentary that is overlooked by a lot of people when talking about the big documentaries of its era, but if you haven't seen it yet, you should. It's good to watch from start to finish, and you won't regret it. Last of this set would mark the end of an era. That a miniseries that lasted for six years would finally come to an end. November 5th, 2005 would end the mark of a trilogy of life, in the final installment of the Walking With series, Walking With Monsters. Monsters had to fight an uphill battle from the start. Dinosaurs uses the familiar dinosaurs for its episodes, obviously, and although beasts use unfamiliar animals, mammals still give a bit of attachment, and a being more recent means that you can put a bit of a spin on it, get more familiar. Everyone knows what a mammoth, and everyone knows what a T-Rex are. A lot less know what a Gorgonopsid is. From the time when pre-production started in 2003, CG was everywhere, especially in nature documentaries. If they want to stand out, frame story everything to look amazing. With the daunting cast ahead, BBC went out to film in Arizona, the Canary Islands, and most harrowing of all, Florida. So, how did it go? Surely with the legacy of the other episodes in the series, it must match them in terms of reception. Ah, uh, well, not exactly. Inherently, sequels are pretty risky. Realistically, you're only going to get people who are interested in the first one. Partially due to this fact, Monsters did not have the best reception on release. For reference, Dinosaurs had 15 million viewers on its first episode. Beast did 8 million, while Monsters did a little over 4.5 million in terms of views. Reviewers also were kind of mixed on it. A few did say it was a nice way to entertain and learn about prehistory. Most, though, were negative to mix, saying the series had lost the wow factor that the other two shows had. Others criticized the focus on heavy action and said it was dumbed down a bit for a general audience. I have to agree a little bit. It's not bad. The series is not bad in and of itself. It looks pretty good. It does have some good moments, but it doesn't feel like it's on the same par as Beasts and Dinosaurs. 
Maybe this is due to the fact that the show has a bit of a different presentation between it and Walking With. The series has a lot more action shots than its originals, a lot more camera abuse and zooms into adaptations. It was made to make viewers feel a little more attached to the oftentimes fantastical Paleozoic creatures, but in my opinion, it just feels a bit jarring. Even more so with the animals abusing and hating the camera, it feels like watching a 3D movie with a 3D. Also, the series foregoes episode and single time period in favor of skipping millions upon millions of years to show how animals evolved over time. It is a nice thing in concept, but I feel more time should have been spent in each location. Due to this, each episode kind of feels rushed, and the series also only has half the numbers the series usually has. This feels really weird to me personally because the time frame between the Cambrian to the Permian was longer than both the Trask to the Cretaceous and the Paleocene to the modern era. There's also a few iconic extinct species that are absent that were really odd to me. Dunkleosti is not being in here at all, and I really would have liked to see some Permian sea life considering the effects of the Great Dying. But then again, most of the series does spend time around water, so it makes sense for it to be on land. There's also just a few CG odysseys as well. Some of the baby models in particular are just Shrek down versions of the adults. That, combined with a lot of reused footage and the fact that this is only half a moment of episodes, can also make me wonder. I'm not sure this is a time crunch or budget constraints, but it wouldn't surprise me. Early CG, especially good looking ones back then, was really expensive. And the budget for monsters was only half of dinosaurs at 3 million pounds. Then again, this is just speculation. But, as I said, the series isn't bad. You can really see how well the CG has come and frames to really flaunts with several close up shots. Also, although they are fairly jarring, the evolution and adaptation shots are interesting to see and are nice in concept. I'm a bit leading into this one due to the fact that animals of this time period don't usually have documentaries. And although I don't think this is equal to his elder sibling, it's still a worthy accessory in its own right. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. One might think with Walking With going the way of the dinosaur, British documentaries, and by extension Framestore, would be out of the picture. However, you'd be wrong. They would have one last triumph, one that asks one simple question. What if extinction didn't have to be forever? <laughs>